I am uh, Dr. Kakur. I was formerly Director Professor of Surgery in Malanzad Medical College. I retired in 2012 and has been associated with private hospitals which have got DNB courses. It's, it's always a pleasure to interact with the young friends like you who are in the initial care stages of surgical career. Today you are residents. Sure enough, another few years, two, three, four years, you will be consultant. And you will be sitting where I am sitting today. We are going to discuss a very common problem, a clinical evaluation of a patient with a goiter. Good old days when these fancy investigations were not available. Radiological, biochemical or nuclear medicine facilities were not available. The diagnosis used to be based on the clinical assessment of a patient. And in the clinical assessment of a patient who comes with a goiter, most of the diagnosis was based on history taking. Goiter was visible. The question was, was this goiter euthyroid? Was this goiter hyperthyroid? Did this goiter have any associated pressure effects? What could be the cause of the goiter was all based on a history taking supplemented with physical examination. When a patient comes to you or brought to you with a goiter, not only you take a history from a patient himself or herself, there are times when you feel it is better to ask the relatives or in case of children, ask the parents about this history. There are many things which a person himself may not be able to explain to you or answer you which you can understand from patient's relatives, especially their behavior especially their attitude, especially their how they have been doing the last few months or years, especially in children. You want to find out whether the patient or features of hyperthyroidism, yes, weight loss in spite of good appetite, poor sleep, nervousness, they are very classical manifestation of primary hyperthyroidism, but in a child may not be able to explain to you that he has lost a weight. It's, it's common that well, a child is growing so he is losing a weight. Or an elderly person, 60 plus, a lady, who has got a goiter. He is not eating, yet she is lo losing a weight. She is not taking interest in the surroundings. She was active, she has lately become inactive. She just keeps sitting. Now, these things can be better appreciated by the patient's relatives. So sometimes you have to ask a history, not only from a patient, but from patient's relatives, especially in hyper and hypothyroidism. Few things what are the pressure effects? Of course, patient himself or herself has to answer the questions. You can diagnose compression effects by radiological investigation. But should you be doing investigations in all the cases, the fancy investigation, 
can't we diagnose some of these conditions on clinical history taking? As a patient, having taken a history, you get to get a vague idea. Is the patient is euthyroid? Is the patient hyperthyroid? As a surgeon, you don't come across a patient who is hypothyroid. They classically go to endocrinologist or to a physician. When a patient comes in the OPD for evaluation, the evaluation does not begin with examination of neck. Examination begins with the moment patient walks inside the OPD. How the patient's overall appearance is. What is the attitude? Is he fidgety? Is he restless? Is it is he looking on all sides? He can't sit at a one place. And if he's sitting with you on a chair, is he fidgeting with a pen or the stethoscope or the pencil on the table? Or you notice that he has got involuntary movements of the hands. Or you look at his dress or or uh, In winter, if a person comes to you, you wearing a jacket or sweaters or a woman is wearing a shawl and a thick sweater, but this person is not wearing any woolens at all and yet she is sweating. That gives a clue that the patient has got features of hyperthyroidism. You don't need a fancy investigation to diagnose that this patient has got a hypothyroidism. All this can be assessed as the patient walks inside the OPD. Before we come to the examination straight to the neck, having done the general physical examination, the important component in a patient whether goiter is examination of radial pulse. One must, I repeat, one must spend one full minute to examine or to palpate the radial pulse. Palpating only for 10 seconds of 15 seconds will never give you a correct diagnosis. Irregular pulse or a collapsing pulse or a irregularly irregular pulse or a missing beat can only be picked up if you have examined a radial pulse for a minimum of one minute by watch. And mind you, in a patient with a goiter, whether it is a primary hyperthyroidism or it is a secondary hyperthyroidism, examination of pulse gives you a lot of clue in establishing or coming to a diagnosis whether the patient is hyperthyroid or not. A missing pulse with doubtful signs of hyperthyroidism in a person with a multinodal goiter is very suggestive that the person has got a secondary hyperthyroidism which is manifesting in the form of a cardiovascular manifestation. The next question is, is this swelling thyroid? Are you sure this swelling in the neck is a thyroid? The classical feature to say that the swelling in that patient who has come to you as a goiter is, ask the patient to swallow. If the swelling moves up 
with swallowing 99% you are right that it is a goiter though you can have a goiter which does not move with the with the swallowing especially if it is a recurrent goiter it is a malignant goiter which is infiltrated into surrounding structures it is anaplastic carcinoma but 9 out of 10 the first thing that one has to do is to look for movement of this swelling on swallowing presence is nearly nearly in the absence of any past history of surgery diagnostic of it to be a goiter it also gives a clue can you see the whole goiter or can you see the lower limit of the goiter or not you don't need straight away a palpation if you can see the lower limit of a goiter obviously patient doesn't have a retrostomal extension and you don't have to uh, investigation or detailed physical examination to exclude that a patient doesn't have a retrosternal extension. For palpation, it can be done from the front, but the best is to stand at the back of the patient, gently, passively flex the muscle so that the muscles and the defacia gets relaxed and it becomes easy to palpate the thyroid gland. This is a sarnoglidomastoid and you palpate one lobe of a thyroid to looking for consistency, firmness, extent, palpate for the other side of the other lobe of the thyroid and ask a patient to swallow. To get to the low limit of a thyroid swelling, which is very, very important, especially if you got a person with a multinodular goiter. Having done the palpation of a thyroid from the back, you come back to the front. Sit in front of a patient nearly at the same level and look for the pressure effects of the thyroid. The, one of the important things to look for is what's happened to this windpipe. That is the trachea. This is a thyroid cartilage. And this is the trachea. We know the thyroid gland is trapped on either side of the trachea. And you want to know whether this thyroid, if one lobe is big compared to the other, is it displacing the thyroid or not? And that, especially if a patient has got a bilobar enlargement, or one lobe is very big, you want to find out whether the trachea has been, which is a midline structure here, whether this enlarged lobe has pushed the trachea to the contralateral side or not, which is important from a surgical point of view. Because when you are operating, you would like to know where the trachea is. And the way to find out is trace the apple's atom downwards, cross the heart bone, feel the trachea and in the suprasternal notch, insinuate your finger between the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid on one side and the trachea and anterior border sternocleidomastoid and the trachea on the other side and notice is the trachea in the midline or not.